For the rest of us, I invite you to have your Bibles. Uh, turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to focus on verses 31 through chapter 5 and verse uh, 7. And as we prepare our hearts for that, let me just uh, read a few of those verses as we look to the Lord together in his word. Chapter 5, verse 1, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and as a sacrifice to God. Father, as we continue to just lean in to your word this morning, as we've just sung and prayed, our ongoing petition, God, is just that you would shape and mold us to reflect more and more of Christ. Lord, may we love you with all of who we are and imitate the love that Christ has. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And amen. I actually need a couple volunteers this morning. I um, need you to actually come up and help me out with something. So that means I actually need you to get you up here. So I don't know if anybody's brave enough to come up here and do that. I promise. There we go. Kelly's right in there. Way to go. Good job. All right. Need a couple more. Need a couple more. Come and join them. Okay. Here comes Vivi. Here comes Jim. I can take one more. No, you can't read that. You can try, though. Okay, it's all good. All right. We got some brave ones up here. Thanks for doing that. Okay, I promise I'm not going to get you to do something dangerous or eat something that's ridiculous, all right? But you may do something that's frivolous, okay? We'll just kind of watch what happens. All right, you know how this one goes. It works like this. <clears throat> Simon says, touch your ear. Okay, there, maybe has got it. Okay, good. All right, so Simon says, touch your other ear. All right, there we go. Good. All right. Simon says, jump on one foot. Okay, here we go. Okay, stop. Oh, Simon didn't say that. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, hang on. Simon says, top the, tap the top of your head. And Simon says, rub your tummy this way as you're doing that. Okay, and Simon says that you're tapping and you're rubbing and you're jumping. Okay, and Simon says, go Chiefs. Oh, Simon says, go Eagles. Uh-oh. Go Vikings. Oh, that's not going to happen. I did say Simon says. Say stop. Okay, you, you did your part. Thank you so much. Good job. Way to go. All right. What does that have to do with Ephesians? There's a lesson that we can learn about God's word through that simple children's game. If Simon says it, you do it. If he doesn't say it, you don't do it. And what God reminds us, very importantly, if Jesus says it, we do it. If Jesus doesn't say it, we don't do it. And God invites us to imitate him and to love like Jesus. That's what he says to us. And this morning we're coming back to that instruction in Ephesians chapter 4. We've been in this chapter for quite some time actually. And we're reminding ourselves again and again, what does it mean to live like Jesus? What is it that Jesus is telling us? And, and so remember, it begins with this exchange life. We make an exchange. We get the old life and we remove it and we put on the new life. And we've put on that new life in Christ. We begin to look and sound and act like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says that for all those who believe, uh, they become a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And so Christ invites us to be putting on our new wardrobe. And you remember with me, last weekend in particular, uh, where we went to, remember before it was this old lifestyle and uh, we had some of those pictures, but uh, our new lifestyle looks uh, a little bit more like this. Uh, verse 25 says, stop telling lies and start telling the truth. You remember that? Paul spells it out for us. He says, now we've talked about take out the old and put on the new. Let me spell it out for you. And so he begins with this thing about truthfulness and honesty and says, verse 25, get rid of falsehood, speak truthfully to your neighbor. We're all members of one body. And so we're to be speaking truth one to another. And honesty and truthfulness matters. And we don't want to be uh, falling for lies. We don't want to become his minions by uh, promoting falsehood and deception and you're going upstream, remember? You're going upstream in our culture because our culture 
is, is filled with lies and dishonesty. It's all around us. And this is going to stand out. If you're living like Jesus, it stands out because honesty and integrity and truthfulness and those kinds of things is running countercultural. And yet that's how Jesus lived and embodied truth. And he invites you and I to do the same. We talked last week again about this whole thing about in your anger, do not sin. And, and remember with me, we're talking about now refuse to let sin mix in with your anger. There's a place for righteous anger. There should be anger over the kinds of things that are created from sin, the brokenness, the fallenness, the standing up for that which is righteous and true. There's a place for that. But our challenge is we mix in uh, sin and, and wrong motives and pride and, and other things. And so the scripture saying now, in your anger, don't sin. Don't mix sin into that anger with selfishness or frustration or, or bullying or those kinds of things. Because that anger, James 119, it doesn't bring about the righteousness that God desires. So be quick to listen, slow to speak, and even slower, the scripture says, become angry. Last week, we talked about this idea of, uh, you know, stop stealing and start working so you can help the needy. And so that five-finger discount needs to go away. We're not, we're not involved with a kind of lifestyle that says we're stealing that which does not belong to us and taking from others, but rather we're to work hard and out of that hard work make enough money that we can turn around and we can actually come alongside people that have great need and help them and come alongside and pour it in. This is spelling out, putting on the new life in Christ versus the old life, the way we used to live. And then we kind of... Uh, Ended up with these last two, right? Use your mouth for good versus evil. And so don't let that unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. And, and we talked about that whole piece of what is it? It's trash talk and, and it's the perverse, obscene, and, and so forth. But rather, when you speak, say things that build other people up and that the people are listening, they're actually edified in that. It's something that's good for them to hear. They're going to be glad they were present for that conversation versus wishing I didn't hear that and I can't stop seeing that, right? Don't let your mouth speak evil, but rather... Uh, be a voice and a, a force for good. And then lastly, as we ended up last weekend, we talked about not grieving the Holy Spirit of God, the one who has sealed us, the one who has prepared us for a day of redemption. And we don't want to wound and offend God's spirit through a rebellious attitude. And, and remember, our life has been bought for a price. And, and so we, we were just talking about this. God, he's spelling it out. He's saying, this is what it looks like. Take out the old, put on the new. This is what it looks like. We didn't get to verse 31. Look with me at verse 31. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every other form of malice. Wow, you want to talk about a vice list? And, and here's the list, right? Six things. And Paul says concerning those things that we need to keep taking out this old and putting on the new, replace the old vices with some new virtues. And, and Paul <clears throat> is saying this. He's not pulling uh, punches. He really uses strong language. I tell you on this and insist on it in the Lord. Verse 17, I insist in the Lord. This is how we are to live as Christ followers. I insist on it. And so here he says, now, with regard to this list of vices, this is not something you want to do. It's interesting. In the original, it's an aorist imperative, which has this idea of it's happening. Now stop it. This is actually happening in the church, these kinds of things. Stop it. This is not how God's people ought to be. And then he goes down and, and creates that list for us to follow through and, and say, now, get rid of the sour face and sour spirit, right? God, God's word says, get rid of that bitterness, that it, sour spirit. And, and as you get rid of that, you're, you're not falling into resentment and in bitterness. And then eliminate those hot outbursts of anger and, and that wrath, that, that more sullen, angry uh, animosity that, that's expressed as rage and wrath and those kinds of things. That has no place, right? In your anger, do not sin. Paul says, take these things off. And as, as you take this one off, now remember too, um, this, uh, the NIV translated as brawling, but it's really this idea of slander and, and uh, raised voices and, and trying to overwhelm the other party by saying how much louder you can say it and trying to push them down in that way, verbal brawling. He says, that has no place in the life of a Christ follower. That's not how we're to live. We're not to be abusive in, in how we speak of others and treat them as our enemy. And, and he says, by the way, get rid of all that malice, that malicious intent to say, I'm going to do something wicked and bad to you, right? I don't get mad, I get even, that kind of deal. And, and, and going down that road and say, that is just not how Jesus would have you to live. It's not how Jesus lived. And so Paul says, I want you to take that off. I want you to put those things away and 
Verse 32, replace them with these virtues, and it's a present imperative, which has this idea, this is a principle of life. This is a way to conduct ourselves. So it says this, be kind, compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. It's interesting because in the original language, the word kind actually looks and sounds similar to Jesus' title as Messiah, Christos. In the original language, that Greek word sounds the same, this word kindness. To be the Messiah was to express God's love in a kind way. And Paul says, I want you to put on that kindness. I want you to be tender-hearted and compassionate and, and show empathy and concern to those around you. And that's exactly what Jesus says in Luke chapter 6 and verse 35. Love your uh, enemies and do good to them. Literally, it says, be kind to them. And does Christ not model this for us in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, where he says, come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, team up with me, go with me in this, and learn from me. Why? Because I'm gentle and humble in heart, the kindness of God. Jesus says, I want you to live like that. Put those things on, not the rage and anger and and malice and and slander and brawling. No, put these things on. In Colossians 3, there's there's a parallel passage that has... Very similar instructions. Talking about clothing again, and isn't it interesting? We just need to be reminded. I noticed everybody wore clothes today. Well done. Good job, right? I hope hope you chose well. You know, the the king in England had a malfunction. Something went wrong with his wardrobe, and wow, that made the news. Um, We we want to choose well. And uh, Colossians tells us again what this looks like in different languages. God's chosen people, holy, dearly loved, clothe yourselves with what? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Here's one. Bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you might have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all those things, put on agape love. Because it just binds them all together in unity and oneness. You know, Paul gives us the Cliff's Notes version. He goes a little bit shorter for us in verse 32. He talks about just simply forgiving each other as in Christ God forgave you. You know one of the great challenges to offer kindness and compassion to people around us? is because, frankly, some of them have said and done things that are wounding to us, hurtful, difficult. And how easy is it to be kind to someone that's not being kind back to you? And God's word reminds us, well, this is why we need to forbear. This is why we need to bear with each other. This is why we need to extend forgiveness one to another. And and as we do so, again, the standard is high, isn't it? Because what's put in front of us is Christ's death on the cross. The forgiveness that was purchased for us. Forgive as God in Christ has forgiven you. What does that look like? Well, he forgave everything in your life that doesn't align with his word and his will. Everything that crossed the line, everything that violated his standards, it's all covered, it's all there. Sin washed away, record expunged, no longer guilty, redeemed, welcomed, restored, reunited with God. Forgive others in the way that you've been forgiven. This is how God would have us to live. This is what it means to love God in that way, by being willing to replace those old vices with those new virtues. Friends, how's it going? Do you feel the challenge of that list? Wow, there are times. I resemble that first list rather than the second list. Paul's saying, remember, when you find yourself in that place, what do we need to do? Stop, take off the old, put on the new. Choose the new. You're going to have pressure from the circumstances of people around you pushing you to react the way you used to. And God's saying, no, I invite you to take off the old and put on the new. In other words, do what God says. I read from uh, Ephesians 5 and verse 1, be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children were to imitate our heavenly father. You could use the word mimic, as in you watch and then you follow what he does. Literally, that sense of imitate here has the idea of not just following, but rather actually becoming like God. So in other words, what he says, you say. What he does, you do. And God invites us to live life that way. Jesus says it, so therefore I'm going to follow it. I'm going to do it. And is that not the definition of what it means to be a disciple? A learner of Jesus to say what he does, I do. I walk in his footsteps. And so God invites us in that way to do what 
he says we're to imitate our Heavenly Father. And didn't Jesus live that way? Think with me for just a minute in the Gospels. What does Jesus say from himself in John 5 and verse 19? The Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. Does that not sound like a new way of living? Whatever the Father does, I'm going to do. John 8, verse 28. Jesus said, I'm, I'm doing nothing on my own, but I speak just what the Father has taught me. I always do what pleases him. Is that not a great way to live? I just choose to do the things that please God. He's told me what they are. They're right here. I just want to live like that. And Lord, thank you that you give me what I need so that I can. You help me to live in that way day by day, moment by moment. I just got to remember this exchange thing and taking off the old and putting on the new and living like Jesus. And in this case, imitating God, our Father, right? And then as you come down to verse 2, it's live a life of love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. In other words, a life of love is a sacrificial life. It's a costly life. And yet it's what Jesus did for each and every one of us. And the Lord says, now, this is how I want you to live. I want you to live like that. Love like Christ loved. Love in a way that is sacrificial. And imitate him in that way and choosing to do what is best for others. And striving in that way and determine, I'm going to choose to live that way. Do you remember Jesus in the garden? Father, if this cup can be taken from me, but not my will. Your will be done. Lord, I'm willing to sacrifice in that way to do what it is that you require. And so there's a laying down of one's life. In Galatians 2.20, Paul describes this same thing, right? I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. This life that I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. He loved me and gave himself up for me. Paul's saying, Jesus laid it all down for me. And he's inviting us to walk in the same pathway. That's what it means in the Bible where it says, take up your cross and follow. It's talking about live a life of sacrifice for the sake of others. Laying down your life for the sake of others. This is part of putting on the new as we've taken off the old. Have you noticed something in this passage? Paul is speaking about the full personhood of God. We're to imitate the Father. We're to live a life of love like the Son. And we're not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The whole personhood of God. Our lifestyle is embracing all that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit want to speak into us. Are you with me so far? Now look at verse 4 and prepare for an abrupt change of directions. Kind of. When you get down to verse 3, actually, verse 3, but among you. When you begin to read through verses 3 and following, it feels like, wow, we just took a sharp right turn. But we really didn't. Remember, we're to do what God says we're to do. And one of the things God says is this, be holy as I am holy. Be pure as I am pure. And God's reminding us of what that looks like in real life. Again, spelling it out in clear terms. And so as we look at these verses, God's word tells us that we're to avoid every kind of impurity. We're not to compromise on holiness. Rather, we're to guard our hearts and protect against these things. And so Paul gets very uh, frank and very to the point and, and really speaks it in a way that you just can't miss it. And here's what he says. Sexual immorality and impurity or greed, those things must not even be mentioned among you as is proper amongst the holy ones or the saints. The NIV says among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. And, and what Paul does is he says, listen, one of the areas that we wrestle with, struggle with, being like God, imitating God, loving like Jesus, is this issue of purity and holiness. And it's a huge issue. Think with me about where this church is located and what kind of world they live in, these believers, in Ephesus. As, as they're there in Ephesus, the moral decadence, indecency is so widespread in the Greco-Roman world. Women were seen as property. Men could do pretty much as they pleased if they wanted. 
Uh, Rome says we're sophisticated. We're a bastion of civilization versus the barbarians. And yet, morally, they're just going down the tube and into the sewer, just more and more and more. And so there's this downward spiral, Romans 1, 24, 26, 27. Paul says, I've given you over to these things that are happening. That was a letter written to the Christians in Rome to say, these are the things that are happening in your world. And in Ephesus, what do you have? You have one of the seven wonders of the world, the tempest to, temple to Artemis. And Artemis was a, a goddess of fertility. You understand what that means? In order to worship that goddess, there had to be religious prostitution that took place. Sexual immorality took place. If you're going to guarantee crops and success in business that you engaged and indulged in these kinds of things. And this is the temple of Artemis. And it's there on the hill and it's right next to the city. And everything in Ephesus revolves around that temple. And all the practices therein. And so notice as Paul's saying, now imitate God, live a life of love like Jesus. What we're looking at is the perversion of that word love. Our world has perverted that word and make it something that it's not. What the scripture does is say, here's what it really means, and here's how you live that out, but not like the world does. And so as you stop and look with me, the very first thing that Paul tackles on that list is thing that we're to get rid of and not have any part of, it's this word porneia, which means we get the word pornography from. And pornography or porneia in the original language has this idea of any kind of sexual sin that you care to name. Everything from sex before marriage to sex outside of marriage with someone other than your spouse, uh, same gender sex, perverted sex acts with animals. I mean, you get the picture. It's anything. It covers all of that. And Paul says, that's, that's nothing that you want to be a part of. That's not what God has for you. And indeed, in our modern culture, what would we add to that list? Pornography on the internet? On our phones? In our homes? I know it goes by different names. Netflix, other stuff, right? There's just stuff so much. And it just permeates. Our culture is permeated in this area of immorality. And God's word's reminding us that there's such a challenge that we face in dealing with those kinds of things. I know it's Super Bowl Sunday. I'm guaranteeing the last thing that you're thinking about on Super Bowl Sunday, if you're a fan and you're all about the game, the last thing you're thinking about is sex trafficking. Well, that's not true. If you were to be in Arizona today, there are all kinds of issues with that, the dark side of the Super Bowl. The prostitution and sex trafficking and all the other stuff that comes with it is usually headline news about busts on those kinds of things and so on. It all follows. It all goes with. And God says in the midst of all that, my people, be holy. As I am holy, don't go down that rabbit hole. Don't, don't head in that direction because... You're settling for something which is, as Paul calls it, unclean, the evidence of a corrupt heart. And more than that, there's a greed. There's this insatiable desire for more. You dabble in a little bit, it sucks you in deeper. You go a little bit deeper, it sucks you in more. And it's emptiness, and it's corruption, and it's a cesspool, and it's all the things that are opposite of what God wants for us, and yet we get tugged in and sucked in, and it pulls us down. Paul says to the church, this ought not to be. This is not how I want you to live. I don't want you to experience those kinds of things. So with regard to actions and, and purity, he talks about sexual purity in that way. Notice with me that he moves next to speech. No obscenity, foolish talk, coarse, crude, joking that are out of place. They don't belong. We're talking dirty talk, obscene, filthy, shameless talk, crosses the line as crude as vulgar. It has no place in the church. And yet, how often does it find its way into the church, into our personal lives? I've shared with you in the last couple of weeks, you know, that for me was an issue as a teenager that I wrestled with, and it was part of my sports and the world that I lived in. And yes, I played hockey, played soccer, I did those kinds of things. And part of my sports world was this was just part of the culture, and I was a part of it. And so Jesus started tapping me on the shoulder and said, that's not how I want you to live. I'm in the Word, I'm reading, I'm realizing, wow, the Bible says don't do that. If it says don't do it, I guess I ought not to do it. And suddenly I'm putting on new instead of old. And, and this is what God invites us to and, and encourages us in to come and, and work with that. I want you to notice with me that as Paul goes down that list, he ends with but rather thanksgiving. 
So let me put this together. No obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, no dirty minds, dirty language, things like that, but rather thankfulness. How does thankfulness fit in the middle of this? There are some people that suggest that it's not okay to talk about um, intimacy and sexual things within a church setting such as this right now. That is not what the Bible is saying at all. What the scripture is reminding us, we don't have to be Victorian about this. We don't, it's not prudish behavior, but follow the divine logic here. The old, depraved, sinful ways of the world are to be cast off or to put something new. So when we talk about uh, sexual intimacy and those things that belong in marriage and the things that God designed it to be and the blueprint of all that that is, that's to be celebrated. He designed it that way. This is where it fits. And guess what? Thankfulness is an appropriate response. When it's, when it's done God's way, when it's done right, this is something that brings joy and fulfillment and something he planned within the bonds of marriage. And, and it's, it's right and proper. And so thankfulness is good in that way. So it's appropriate on that side. We're free to express that gratitude, but at the same time, that requires a willingness to observe the boundaries and stay in bounds, right? You understand what happens if there's a flag in the field? There was a penalty. You're out of bounds. Something happened. Ought not to happen. Play stops. We get to go from there. It's like the Apostle Paul threw a flag in the field. Say, whoa, hang on. I know what happens in Ephesus, and some of you are still wrestling with this. And God wants to set you free. You are free. Use your freedom not to indulge the sinful nature, Galatians says, but rather to serve others in love. And so God invites us to live that way. And so we're, if you substitute these sinful desires for God, that becomes costly, right? Hebrews 13, 4, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure because God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral because we need to understand that if you go your way versus God's way on these things, is costly. We need to hear that. We need to acknowledge that. If we cave into those desires, the Bible is something that's called sowing and reaping. And you can't escape from it. You don't get to sow the seed and hope there's no crop. You're praying for crop failure. No, it, there are consequences. There's things that come. And God's word is just so abundantly clear in this area. And so he just lays it out for us. He says, make no mistake. Be very certain of this. No immoral, impure, greedy person, they're an adulterer, has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. And if someone's trying to convince you otherwise, he says, listen, that's just empty language. That it doesn't ring true and it's not going to hold up before the Lord. Don't go there. Paul's inviting us to do differently. Galatians 6 and verse 8. If you sow to please your sinful nature, the old way of doing things, here's what it brings. Destruction. If you sow to please the Spirit, from the Spirit you reap eternal life. Do we understand that if you compromise on the truth, sowing and reaping, is there anybody who's never experienced consequences from bad choices? I better put my hand down. Right? All of us. And in this area, in terms of purity, sexual purity and those kind of things, poor choices, things that happen, You've heard of sexually transmitted diseases, broken homes, broken relationships, shattered dreams, the inability to actually enjoy genuine intimacy with a spouse because there are other people that are in the way and all that comes with that. Sowing, reaping. This sounds like a lot of bad news, doesn't it? Here's some good news in the midst of it all. If we've crossed the line if we've gone where the God's word says don't go there, if we've transgressed his rule, his law, his moral law, which is for our good, if we've violated that, the scripture has some good news. If you'll own it and turn away from it and acknowledge it, that's called repentance, and ask for forgiveness. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. What's unclean, what's impure, what's unholy can by the grace of God be restored and forgiven. And there is proof in the scriptures, you might write this down, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, Paul's talking to another church family and saying, listen, some of you were in this place. Before you knew Christ, you were sexually immoral, you were adulterers, people caught up in prostitution, same-sex relationships. That was true of you. This is where you were, 
And then God got a hold of your life. And so verse 11 says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were declared not guilty, that's the word justified, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. And so this is more than possible for God. He can take that which is broken, that which has crossed the line, that which has gone where it ought not to go. And God says, if you'll own it, if you accept it and respond in repentance and say, God, I messed up. And I'm acknowledging that, and I recognize it right now, and I say that back to you. God, would you have mercy on me? Have mercy on me a sinner? And God says, I will. I will extend grace and forgiveness. And so you're not cast out. You're not cut off from God, but rather you're welcomed in. You're forgiven. You're clean. You're holy. You're who God wants you to be because you're clothed with Christ. God says, if you'll imitate me in this, if you'll love like Jesus you're going to be a messenger of that and help other people understand just because you messed up doesn't mean it's forever broken if you'll fess up, if you'll own it, if you'll turn from it, if you'll accept the life that God has for you in Christ. Notice the last word that Paul says there. How does he put it? Therefore, don't be partners with them. In other words, don't get mixed up in those kinds of things, but rather replace the old with the new. Love God. Imitate him. Live like Jesus, old to new, the life that God's called us to be. Friends, what would happen if you and I lived this out daily, where we live? I mean, God's word is touching on topics that for all of us, have you noticed how quiet it got in here? I mean, this touches us. Why? Because it cuts to the core of who we are. And there's not a single person in this room right now that isn't in some way perhaps thinking about the fact, wow, that one. Oh, maybe that too. I wrestle with. And you understand your Heavenly Father saying this morning, I know. And there's a way of escape. There's no temptation that you face that there isn't a way out. There's God's way. It's called do as he does that says to do. And so the way of escape is we own it, we confess it, we turn from it. And by God's grace, we begin to walk in this new way of life. And God says, I will be all that you need. I just invite you to walk that way. Young or old, doesn't matter. God's saying, I'm inviting you to live like Jesus. Because our world needs a whole lot more of Jesus. And Jesus comes to our world through you and I. Our lives change, transformed by the Holy Spirit. Our world needs a lot more. And he's looking to us. And saying, you're my plan A. I want the church to be the church. Live worthy of the calling that you've received. Be who God's called you to be. In oneness, in unity, in purity, in holiness, speech, action. In every way, be and live like Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning as we... Look to your word together. There's a weightiness to it because, God, it touches on parts of our lives that we're not always wanting to talk about or even acknowledge. Father, some of us wrestle with being clothed with Christ. We wrestle with being honest and truthful. Father, we rec recognize that you're asking us to be kind and compassionate, but often perhaps we're harsh, impatient, selfish, proud, Lord, there's times where anger crosses those lines where it ought not to go. There's times, Father, where we know that we've crossed lines when it comes to purity and matters of sexual intimacy and those kinds of things. It's not just the physical act, God. It's our minds. It's our thoughts. It's, it's all of those things, the things we let our eyes see, all of it, God. And, and you invite us to take all of those things and lay it down in front of you and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, forgive me where I cross that line. Lord, would you help me even now by faith to take this old me, this old self, and just take it off, strip it off, throw it away, and to put on Christ. The power of Christ, the love of Christ, so that, Lord, I could walk in your footsteps. Lord, it's more than possible. Dead to sin, alive to God in Christ Jesus.
Lord, this is the life that you've called us to live. This is what it means to put on the old. Or take off the old, rather. Put on the new. And so, Father, that's our prayer. As we sing this uh, closing song this morning, I pray, Father, that you'd be talking to our hearts right where we are, the things that each one of us has. There's no one in this room that can walk out of this building today or those online and say, well, that was good. I hope someone else is listening. Lord, you're inviting each of us to respond to you this morning. May we do it by faith, in humility, calling on your name. You are mighty to save. You do move mountains. You are well able. But Lord, you always wait for a heart that is yielded and surrendered. May that be true of us today. I pray in Christ's name.